Hi, I'm Lexi Brewer with the Denver City Foresters Office under Denver Parks and Rec. I know that lately many of us have been spending more time than usual indoors and we've been more grateful than ever to spend time in the beautiful parks offered by Denver Parks and Rec. Today I'm in Harbor Gulch Park to share three stories about how we've integrated the natural environment into our city of Denver, as well as to show you different ways that you can help us to maintain and restore our urban tree canopy. We'll hear from three Denver Parks and Rec experts to understand how water is a scarce and precious resource here, and then how that we can use that water to help build and maintain our urban tree canopy, and then how in turn that tree canopy helps to foster life and community. We'll also help to answer any questions that you have, including some of the questions that we receive more commonly with the Denver City Foresters Office. So if there's anything that you're curious about, feel free to post that below. First, we'll hear from Damian Wetzel, who's the Water Conservation Program Administrator of Denver Parks and Recreation. Water in Denver is a, is a very valuable resource. The ecosystem of Denver is, you know, semi-arid, high plains. Um, and we receive, you know, anywhere from like 10 to 13 inches of rain a year, um, which isn't a lot. Uh, like this park here, Wash Park, where we're at, takes about 30 inches of water a year to maintain the, the bluegrass and trees that everyone enjoys. So to make that gap up between the rain that Denver receives and the water that's needed for the parks, uh, we have irrigation. So, you know, we water the parks between three and four times a week. Underground, it's kind of the uh, you know invisible lifeblood of Denver Parks. I pay all the water bills for Denver Parks and Rec, so you know sounds like a normal task that everyone does out there, uh, except for I have 1,100 of them. Every rec center, uh, every park, every median, anything you could think of, uh, there's a water bill for. We adhere to strict water budgets based on you know the landscape type, the vegetation's there. So through the water bill, we track how much water we're using and then look at ways that we could be really efficient and conserve. One of the ways that we're trying to conserve water is the central control build out. So we have over a thousand, you know, irrigation controllers all throughout our parks. And we are in the middle of converting all those to central control. An irrigation controller has a radio antenna on top of it. And then the radio antenna talks to a base station antenna, uh, which we have over 30 of those all across the city. And then those big base station antennas are tied into our network. Uh, an irrigation technician can sit at their desktop computer and program and make changes based on weather. If it's gonna rain, you can shut your parks down. It's proven that central control, uh, we're saving between 15 and 20% with that technology. If we get those rains in the middle of the night, which happens all the time in Denver, um, rain cups are out there catching the rain, measuring it. If we get a quarter inch or half inch of rain, they're sending signals out to the different central controllers across the city and shutting them down. So Wash Park here is 105 acres. Um, in one night of irrigation, we use a million gallons of water. In one night. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot of water. Uh, so imagine ac across the city, shutting down all those controllers through weather stations, how many millions of gallons of water that saves. And that just translates into, you know, money and, and resources that we're saving the city. Standing right next to uh, Smith's Ditch, this is one of the original irrigation canals in the city of Denver. So it started working in 1918. Smith's Ditch is filled with recycled water. So Denver water uh, recycles our wastewater and they pipe it all the way to uh, by South High School and they fill Smith's Ditch there starting at Veterans Park. General guideline is about 10 gallons per week per caliper inch a tree. It takes a lot of water to get trees going but then once a tree is mature and established you know the benefits it provides are immense with the shade and you know ends up being a a water conservation tool once once a tree is fully established. Uh, you know, helps with the heat island effect, keeping heat down, um, filtering the air. Um, so, you know, trees are a great advantage to an urban, urban setting like Denver. Kentucky bluegrass is obviously not a native to uh, 
Denver in the Front Range. It's the name Kentucky Bluegrass. It's from Kentucky, uh, but it is the you know the most desirable choice of grass for parks. It's self-repairing. It's soft. You can mow it. It's uh, good for athletic fields. Good for all the pressure that people put on it. You know what we're doing in the future is we understand the importance of bluegrass. It's people enjoy to picnic on it, play sports on it. But we're trying to minimize that in new park design moving forward. We're trying to adapt and use less water in the future, like we're saying, as it becomes more and more valuable. We do not water the parks in winter. Similar at your, at your home, you gotta go attach an air compressor and blow it out. We just have big air compressors. Here at Wash Park, the main line of the system's over five miles long. On top of that, you have over 500 zones of irrigation. So it takes about, takes a little over a week to blow this whole park out. I'm a sprinkler geek. I don't, you know, I don't know why that is. I enjoy just sitting and watching sprinklers operate. It's kind of uh, soothing, you know. All the new homes and people and people that uh, are out enjoying the parks requires more and more uh, water to keep everyone happy and safe and all that good stuff alive. <laughs> really great to find out how water is a scarce resource here. But now I'm curious about our trees. How does the climate impact what can and can't grow here? Let's hear from Ben Rickenbacker of Denver Forestry to find out more. Really in the Denver area before man came, this was basically a high plains desert, very dry, arid environment. You look at some of the eastern cities, lots of those cities were actually a forest and then they removed the trees to create the city. But with Denver, we built our forest so we take a lot of pride in our trees and we have a lot of value in those trees and as you can see on a hot summer day where's everybody gonna be hanging out right underneath the shade of these nice maple trees that were uh, here in City Park. Yeah I mean trees have a lot of benefits you know they provide all sorts of materials fruit wildlife habitat they sequester carbon they also um, storm water retention. So when you have those massive flood events, the trees actually soak up a lot of that water. Just the beauty of trees, that, that's a big one. So the right of way is basically in a typical neighborhood, Denver neighborhood is gonna be the area between the sidewalk and the curb, the sidewalk and the street. And we call that the tree lawn. Usually that's an area that's actually owned by the city. We get a lot of storm damage. So if the trees have already leafed out and they've got, um, a lot of wet, heavy spring snow. It tends to break the branches, and uh, we call that storm damage. And so it's a good, good idea to keep your trees pruned. With the licensed and insured tree care company, um, they're gonna follow all the regulations through OSHA and through the ISA and uh, TCIA and make sure that they have the right PPE on, which is personal protective equipment. Um, today in the COVID environment, a lot of people are thinking this for the PPE, but in the tree care industry, it's hard hat, it's gonna be safety glasses. You're gonna to wanna to have uh, long pants, chaps if you're running chainsaws. So all, all those sorts of things and setting out proper cone zones um, to identify your work area so you don't want anybody from the public or homeowners walking into your work zone where things could be falling from aloft. You know, we wanna make sure that not only the trees are safe, but uh, the public is safe as well with those contractors. Mulch your trees. Too much of a good thing can be bad as well, so keep that in mind. Don't pile up and do the mulch volcanoes. You want to make sure the mulch is pulled away from the trunk of the tree. There's a lot of benefits to mulch. Uh, not only the good barrier from string trimmers and weed whackers, but it provides organic material. So our soils in Colorado, at least in the Denver area, aren't real great, so they actually add some organic matter into the soil. They actually insulate the root systems of the trees as well, so in those real cold winter, uh, nights, they actually keep the roots warm and the opposite in the summer when it's 100 degrees out, they can actually keep the roots from getting too hot from the sun. So, you know, planting the right tree in the right place. Um, we get this a lot where, a, you know, the common one is a blue spruce that was a, you know, Arbor Day seedling giveaway. Somebody say, oh, this is nice and cute. They plant it right by their front doorstep. And those things get 70, 80 feet tall and they'll completely swallow your whole front yard. So. Um, Something to think about, how big is that tree going to get before you plant it? Are you going to plant it next to the house? Are you going to give it enough room? Um, are you going to plant it underneath the power lines? Is it going to be growing to the power lines and have to get pruned by the utility companies down the road? Trees kind of like to be socially distant, so to speak. With the, um, if you look at here, you know, all these trees that are planted around me, you know, they've given adequate space to grow. And also get a healthy tree, too. 
Trees aren't the good thing to buy at like the end of season sale at your local big box store where they're all 50% off. You want to get a nice, vigorous, healthy tree that's going to uh, thrive in your landscape. Be a smart ash program. Uh, it's a program, it's basically an educational program to let the public know about emerald ash borer and educate. It could be in your tree for maybe a few years before, it's, before it can be detected. Basically, the Be a Smart Ash program, you know, we're actively treating trees throughout the city. So a lot of our park trees that we want to preserve, we're treating those, giving away free trees for the public. So we're planting trees in, in public right away um, for areas that qualify. So go on the beasmartash.org and there's an application you fill out. You give your address and someone will contact you. We'll give you a, a choice of some species that we'd recommend for that area. And we'll come out, plant the tree and uh, water the tree. There's a lot of history with these trees. And a lot of the trees that we're staying around here, these older cottonwoods, I mean, they're probably over 100 years old. Trees can tell us a lot about the environment, tell us a lot of history. You just feel good when you're hanging around around trees. There's nothing better than being in a park full of trees or being out in the forest. It's, uh, it's just a warm and fuzzy feeling. Thanks so much, Ben, for sharing all that great information about trees. Now I'm curious to know, how trees can work with the greater ecosystem to help benefit our native birds and pollinators. Let's talk with Julie, the horticulture and greenhouse manager of Denver Parks and Rec to find out. Denver Water uh, coined the term xeriscaping as a way to bring knowledge to people and really start talking about what needs to be grown here and what does well here without a lot of extra supplemental water and other things that we don't want to put into our environment. You know, we're basically in a steppe climate. We're in a very arid climate that people have brought in what they liked and loved from other places. So many of the trees that are here, many of the, you know, the greenery that you see out there is not native to here. It's what people were used to and what they love to see. As water becomes less available and as we get more and more people in this urban setting, the arid environment really makes a difference. A lot of the native plants don't really like fertilizer. That's not what they're used to. There's not a lot of organic uh, matter in our soils here. It all you know, starts with water, but it comes down to just what it's used to in its soil structure as well as a plant, um, what you have to give it to make it live. Anything that's native to this area obviously does well. Um, there's a lot of plants from other steppe regions in the world that do really well here. There's Mongolia or Peru and Chile have a steppe uh, region that things do well, that plants grow well here. It's basically matching that how many inches of rainwater we receive to what other areas that have that same amount. And then, and that, you know, obviously there's, it's colder here, so that's a different thing that you have to think about. The urban canopy does a lot for air quality. There's a lot of people who are really against bluegrass turf and it, it, it isn't native here and it takes a lot of work, but it also does a lot for our air quality. It cleans a lot, you know, anytime there's greenery in a space, it's going to clean toxins, give us cleaner air, cleaner water, and just a better life. Birds and pollinators have always been here. Uh, they've always been a big part of the ecosystem and a really big part of what makes everything go around. The hummingbirds that come through here every year and have for centuries, they, they like certain plants that they can feed from that really work for them and that, you know, people are, that, that haven't been planted for a long time. People are starting again. Japanese beetle is the big, big thing right now. The last five years or so, the numbers have really, really spiked and that's one that's really hard. It doesn't, they don't have any natural predators here. They'll kind of push out some of our other pollinators just by the fact that they will eat the plant and, and decimate the plant so badly that it's not blooming like it should and there's not nectar and there's not a source for the other insects to come in and they're big you really see them and one of the things that you can do with the japanese beetle is uh, just have a cup of soapy water and just knock them off if you have a real small small garden space that's probably one of the best ways to get rid of them rather than going out and spraying them and and maybe harming other pollinators or other other species just uh, knock them off and drown them and be done with them we have over 900 native bees in colorado and th so those are in direct competition a lot with the, the European honeybee and um, planting native plants and t wanting to help those insects is a really big thing. There's a really big decline in those numbers of our native bee populations. If you're on a block, for example, with uh, 10 houses and three of them have 
honey beehives, you're not going to have enough garden space for them to feed on. You know, honey bees can go maybe five miles. Native bees maybe go a half a mile or even less than that. A lot of them are ground nesters that live in the ground. Um, the honeybees are very aggressive and they do tend to push out all of our native bees. I do design reviews for the cities. The new Stapleton area is kind of what we're pushing towards and looking at. We really need to kind of get back to the prairie that we naturally was here. And so the designs that we're putting in out there are about 70% uh, prairie grass and native areas. Someday if we're on uh, all recycled water, which could happen, uh, you know, what's going to work for that? And then also just adding the native plants for our pollinators and, you know, knowing that what used to be here and what we now have available to, um, that we can grow and, and plant out there to make sure that we are um, helping with any of the, you know, the species reduction that's happening. The garden that we have here at the greenhouse is a trial garden for some of our annual displays, but also we have a lot of native plants out there that we are growing to see what kind of space they can be grown in. There's get really getting to be a big choice of native plants at your local garden centers, like there didn't used to be at all. You don't have to have a huge space to help with pollinators and to help um, get, you know, have, get back to what we need. So if you have a small space in your yard that you could plant, uh, you know, most insects can't go very far. So if you have a very small space and you can still plant something and grow something, even if you don't know a lot about gardening, you can start small and every single little piece that uh, people do is helpful and is making a mark out there. I think people are nervous or scared of gardening if they haven't done it before. And you can start really small and you're still, you know, you're still gonna make a huge difference. Thanks again for tuning in today. This has been a really great intro about how we've incorporated the natural environment into the built environment of Denver. I know that these days I've been really appreciative of the parks and outdoor spaces that we have, and I hope that you've been able to too. You can help grow and maintain our urban tree canopy with us by signing up for a free tree at beasmartash.org or reaching out to us at forestry at denvergov.org. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have through that email or in the comments below. Thanks again for tuning in and learning with us, and we hope that this helps you to enjoy the water, trees, and life that you find in Denver.